Good afternoon. Um, I'm Martin Myron from the British Art Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon to the second in a series of three live events entitled Museum Collections on Prescription, Health, Wellbeing and Inclusivity. Uh, the series is produced as a collaboration between three professional networks, the British Art Network, the European Paintings Pre-1900 Network and Understanding British Portraits. They investigate the relationship between art collections, inclusivity and visitor well-being, exploring the intersection between art and healthcare, museum collections and representation, engagement and mental health. Today's session has been convened and will be chaired by Katsu Roberts from uh, Vital Arts um, and I will be uh, introducing Katsu in a moment. Before then, a few brief points of housekeeping. There's a resource pack of references and further reading uh, relating to all three sessions um, available um, so you can follow up on case studies and publish research in the area after today's event. Uh, we'll also be sharing a website link where you can access the resource. And actually, I think in the chat already, there's a link to uh, materials relating to the um, three sessions. Thank you, Morton. And um, thank you for the invitation to, to convene the session today on arts and well-being. So I've been a curator for 30, 30 years, mostly in the public sector and all within contemporary art. For the past decade, I've been working within the NHS, commissioning site-specific projects. My aim has been to transfer years, many years, of curatorial experience to the hospital context where art can have an impact unlike any museum, Kunsthalle, biennial, et cetera. So I'm delighted to be convening the session today entitled The Curatorial and the Cultural Encounter in the Hospital Context. I put together a program that will explore aspects of arts and health in a field which has come into sharp focus in recent years, and even more so since the pandemic. I've invited Eva, Dr. Eva Fattorini, who is the founder of Artisan. She is the former founding director and chair of the Cleveland Clinic Global Arts and Medicine Institute. She will discuss how art supports well-being and assists healing. She will also look at extending access to art via telehealth. Also joining us is Daniel Heather, he is deputy archivist of the Museum and Archives at Bart's Health NHS Trust, and he will discuss collecting and curating in the pre-NHS hospital. Also with us is artist Peter Liversidge, whose practice has often intersected with the NHS. He will, he will present some of those projects. His work has been exhibited widely, including at the Tate, Whitechapel, and internationally. During the comfort break, please note, we will show a film by Peter that grew out of his project at the Royal London Hospital. It features comedian Phil Jupitus reading NHS related jokes. But we will start with my presentation, which will give a overview of the arts and health organizations that I lead. Whoops. Um, in order to talk generally about providing access to art, commissioning public work and curatory ambition within the healthcare environment. Hospitals are key municipal spaces. They evolve from ancient Greek temples and later monasteries, and they form part of the civic complex, like churches, town halls, and libraries. Hospitals are intended to serve and to welcome the community, and they should signal as much with uplifting, generous public spaces, like this one here you see of Bart's. So, um, so uh, this is an example of a very generous public um, civic space that you can see at Bart's. The erosion of the public realm by market forces has stripped and already squeezed NHS of any illusions of grandeur. Nonetheless, hospitals remain important to community life, forming a crossroads of human activities. These large municipal buildings serve a diverse public who daily pass through in their thousands whether arriving via the ground floor or the helicopter pad. The public nature of these 24 seven buildings means they are never emptied of possible viewers, thus providing a service of well-being being that goes beyond the strictly somatic. And as such, hospitals are ideal places to introduce new audiences to the transformative power of art. Arts and health is a growing field, it's a thing. 
And there is increasing evidence of the benefits that exposure to significant art has on supporting well-being. Eva will speak more to this point. But what's clear is that art strategies are now included as standard practice for new and refurbished healthcare buildings across the UK and abroad. They, they are seen, art strategies in hospitals are seen as a means to humanize the clinical environment, but hopefully they push well beyond that as well. Vital Arts is the arts organization embedded within Barts Health NHS Trust, which includes five hospitals in East London. We serve 2.5 million people in some of the most disadvantaged communities in the UK. We are charitably funded, so we have no budget from the NHS for the delivery of art. Turning to some of that art now, I'll quickly show you a string of site-specific commissions. These are in entrances. in different buildings across our hospital. Producing ambitious projects raises the standard of art in hospitals, and I would argue in public, for public art in general. It's about bringing great, muse great art, let's say museum quality art, to those people who might not necessarily visit museums. Unlike most art venues, we have, for better or for worse, a captive audience. And this is, of course, especially true in waiting areas. which I show you several examples of. Here patients can spend long stretches of time with an artwork. I show you some more examples across our many buildings. So someone's first encounter with contemporary art may very well be at a hospital. So hospitals have the opportunity to generate memorable aesthetic and perhaps why not philosophical experiences that are meaningful, nourishing and impactful. Vital Arts does this with a range of established and emerging artists, some of them listed here. Hospitals can offer patients and staff, visitors and the wider hospital community, cultural encounters that might prove inspiring and mind opening. And given we have miles of corridors, hospitals don't lack exhibition space or venue. We don't lack venue. Um, I'll show you some examples of what we've done in order to not leave our corridors looking like this. So again, these are across our, all of our five hospitals and in different departments. It's worth noting that all these works must comply with strict guidelines on health and safety, security, and infection control, which of course is even more important in treatment areas such as these. Here I show you an example of a before and after. Each artwork is accompanied by a didactic label that provides information about the artwork as well as the artist, just like any museum label, offering insight and context in order to engage a wide audience. And of course, we bring art directly into wards. So these are more examples. This is the artist in front of his artwork. Uh, this one is especially vibrant and um, forms a strong contrast with this one which is uh, a ward in our former Georgian building depicted uh, in 1914. So we've, we've come a long way, I would say. Arts and Health has really um, made some progress. But just so you don't think it's all color and animals, which is a very easy trap for hospital art, especially in children's areas, I show you this work. Um, indeed, there are areas where bright and cheery is just simply not appropriate. These works by Amalia Pika have a restrained palette. They are joyful and quietly funny, and they hold up with extended viewing, which is key in these isolation rooms where each patient is confined for days, sometimes weeks. So these works are each made only using rubber postal stamping. This is an art strategy developed especially for chemotherapy where patients can feel very nauseous. So the work is calming and quiet. There is a strong strand of uh, what I have to call horror vacui running through the NHS. So often more is less. 
just to have things that are calm and clear. This calm work is an indication that each art strategy is carefully considered and it takes context into account such as the surrounding community, the services and treatment being accessed, and of course, the demographics of a particular patient group. So a sexual health clinic, which sees young people will require a very different artwork, say than the dementia ward, for example. Consulting closely with clinical staff, arts and health teams learn about the treatment being offered and how patients and family are affected. We are acutely aware of how artwork might cross their field of vision all of which informs the briefs we develop, the artists we select, the curatorial process, and ultimately the outcome of each artwork. As well as patient responsive, these projects are always site specific. Vital Arts rarely acquires existing work. We just don't intersect with the art market, nor do we usually accept most unsolicited donations. Rather, we seek to generate works through commissioning. These emerge from a long and deep engagement with the hospital context. Many of the artists we commission collaborate with staff and our patients. I'm remembering Jacques Nimke spending many nights in the A&E uh, trying to get a sense of how the space worked, how it was used, and just to, in order to respond to his brief. Others, other artists dive into the Trust's vast archive and explore a hospital's history and its neighborhood. So I, I show you now, as did Peter Liversidge, for example. He was an artist in residence researching Whitechapel. He will speak more about the project and others that he's done, but I just quickly show you this derelict building that we roamed, salvaging books, hardware, and even paint from the Georgian walls to include in his installation. But right at the top there of the building <clears throat> was the former residence of a certain Joseph Merrick, AKA the Elephant Man. Richard Wentworth also searched the archives for his commission. He uses photos that feature objects that are inherently sculptural, not dissimilar to his own work. You can see these various scientific contraptions here. Uh, these very atmospheric images imparts a strong flavor of the older buildings at Bart's, as, just as we were opening the brand new PFI buildings. Archives also feature in this commission, which is informed and inspired by the history of Barts. It draws on the 18th century fashion for print rooms, and it is composed of images of medical teams. But bringing historic objects into, the new, into a new hospital building or a different context is not unrelated, are not unrelated to the curatorial approach of intervention as practiced, for example, by Hans Ulrich Obrist at the Sohn Museum, for example, or much earlier by Fred Wilson with his seminal show, Mining the Museum, where he introduced objects used in the slave trade into displays of luxury items. For his commission, Roger Shorns consulted the chief archivist. He sifted through our museum collections. He scoured a condemned hospital building in search of items to subject to his signature crystallization process. After several days of prowling the evacuated, obvious, uh, uh, the evacuated offices, which were redolent of the abandoned Mary Celeste, Roger and I alighted upon these clocks that were just quietly ticking away in the dark. And these formed the basis of his installation for us. Leela Fowler took inspiration from the magic lantern slides that she discovered in archives in Epping Forest and the Vestry Museum for our hospital in Waltham Forest, which is, not, which is nearby. Daniel will speak more about the extensive archives and history of Barts, but I do show you one good example of a site-specific commission artwork by none other than local artist, William Hogarth. I should add, this was not a vital arts commission, of course. Um, Key to innovative art programs within healthcare is selecting artists who have not already made work for hospitals. And better yet, artists who have not been previously commissioned. Like Hogarth here, for this work, in fact, it was his first commission, and there's an interesting story there. As such, we take creative risks knowing that outcomes are not fully predictable. And this is essential to generate significant art that contributes to the redistribution the redefinition of hospital art and to public art in general, which all too often is anodyne art by committee 
and it's aimed at some insipid general public. I have to say that the intensity involvement, the scope of ambition, and working in such a determined and, comp and, uh, determined and complex content frequently pushes artists to new creative territories, but it always yields original and unanticipated results. Part of that risk taking for the sake of making cultural contribution is working with people who sit outside a strict definition of art. For example, we commissioned Taddy Devine, the jewelry designers who made their first art installation for us. Others include toy makers, children's author, a theater set designer, as well as a cartoonist, uh, Tom Galt, whose cartoon you see here. Tom regularly features in The Guardian and The New Yorker magazine, and his commission with us translated his 2D illustrations into an installation that wraps around. Oops. I, I think I can get this to move. No, to animate this. There we go. Thought I could do it. Um, so he his commission with us took his two dimension his two dimensional illustrations and it wrapped around the cystic fibrosis installation uh, unit. Sorry, it wraps around the cystic fibrosis isolation unit. This work is based on mirror type cards, mirror Rama type cards, that create variations of an imaginary urban park, with a list of symbols that becomes like a treasure hunt that include drop keys or haunted lawn, invisible portal in, in the legend. Tom's deadpan and slightly dark humor resonates with the teenagers and the young adults confined to the unit. Here's Tom donning PPE uh, when he was um, on one of the several days he came to meet with patients, which is absolutely central to the project. Another project which entailed heavy involvement with patients is a packet of flashcards used to communicate with reticent dementia patients. Ruth Ewan collected stories from older patients and created these to trigger memories and to encourage conversation. They were developed with dementia specialists and are, or they are actually in use in the wards now. So it's an artwork as well as a functioning tool. This patient engagement is really key to many commissions as well as the workshops and temporary projects involving collaboration. I, I, I'll quickly show you some examples. So Jessica Vorzanger created some comic books that we published to distribute to patients and their families. Faisal led a workshop exploring identity. Lem Sise was our poet in residence in 2011 before becoming the official poet for the Olympics. Shiraz worked with refugee children facing trauma. Sam did an intergenerational project that involved a parade. And before they were celebrity caterers, Bombas and Parr created a jelly spectacular for us. Many of these are with children because the Royal London has an actual school within it for long-term and chronically ill patients. But of course, we also serve other patient groups in renal, for example, and through literature, which is another strand that, that we um, program. And this literature strand also includes a cookbook for renal patients that will be hopefully published very soon. It, making it involved recipe writers, nutritionists, renal specialists, and many, many patients from the renal community. Like most art programs for hospitals, Vital Arts also brings dance and music directly to patients. There's small, just a small example of our dance and music. We'd like to push this audio element uh, at Vital Arts uh, even further. And we'd like to commission music and sound projects that would be played across our hospital radio stations. So this is an example of what it may or may not look like in the future. But to deliver all of these and all of our projects, in fact, it's important to forge strong ongoing partnerships. And here's a few of the organizations with whom we have collaborated. Yet offering access to art extends to staff as well as to patients. A current project 
called hashtag 100 NHS rooms was developed in response to the extra stress on our clinical colleagues due to COVID. It entailed dozens of artists making new work to be installed specifically within the staff area, in those staff areas that are used for rest and respite. The project attracted a lot of attention and the feedback from staff was great. One said, I didn't know I liked art until I started working at the Royal London Hospital, which is fortunate because it's 15 floors stacked with art top to bottom. You'll notice most of our works are not discrete autonomous objects. The collection does contain, consist of more than 2000 works, but we don't, we don't view it as an accumulation of items. Like the Hogarth, many of the works are integrated into the architecture, such as these backlit photos built into the ceiling in radiotherapy. So here patients are supine looking up at the work. Another work which is integrated uh, into the architecture is this one, which is, is actually drilled into the wall. And here's another example. This is canvas that's fit precisely to the uh, 18th century building. But if not embedded, it always takes into account the, specific, the specificity of the existing architecture and works with and around it. Just just show you some examples here. The artworks are often immersive installations that run through the space, such as these. And that immersive experience is especially true when artists design the furniture or the curtains. When you consider that the curtain envelops a patient it becomes really important to consider that as a vehicle for perhaps a panoramic view of art. It becomes a vehicle to show art because the, the curtain is so present in the room. Like any ambitious arts and health organization, we are thinking across the patient experience and we are attending to the entire human lifespan from unborn babies to the recently departed. Here's a work in antenatal as well as a work in the DPHU, the Dead Persons Holding Unit, otherwise known as the morgue. For this work, motifs from the artwork were extended to the production of tote bags for use by family to carry home the personal effects removed from the deceased in a thoughtfully designed hold all. So this is just a small fraction of what we've done. And I'm sorry to wind up on rather a morbid note, but um, we have, developed hundreds of projects. And hopefully this gives you an overview of how art and hospitals can be pioneering in order to furnish meaningful artworks for a wide public and at the same time improve the hospital experience. So I tried to offer you a little look behind the hospital curtain here and invite you to consider hospitals as viable venues for displaying significant contemporary art an art that will reach a vast audience who might be underserved by the culture sector. And I do that before handing you over to Eva. Katsu, that was phenomenal presentation, phenomenal presentation. I'm now so in your world, it makes me <laughs> want to go to visit hospital to see what you have done. So um, thank you for sharing with us and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to speak at this audience, for this audience. I'm going to share with you today um, a little bit about myself and my journey and why arts and medicine is so important. Uh, so my name is Eva Fattorini. I'm a doctor and dermatologist by training and have been in healthcare for more than 20 years. I have experienced it as a clinician, patient, and administrator on three different continents. I'm also founder of Artocene. It's a company that operates in the intersection of arts and health. Prior to that, I was holding executive role at the Cleveland Clinic, as Katsu mentioned, uh, which is an integrated healthcare delivery system with hospitals, clinics, and wellness centers in the United States, Canada, United Arab Emirates, and opening in London soon. One of the many important things that I had learned on this journey is that all of us humans were mesmerized by rapid development of technology in the last hundred years. 
and on that journey, medicine has lost its soul. So I think the integration of arts with medicine can rehumanize it and awaken the souls of the hospitals. You know, we are not questioning ourselves what's the purpose of existence of the hospitals. Of course, we know why they exist. And we are not questioning the existence of museum. So I'm wondering why are we questioning the coexistence of these two things? So if you want to build these programs, obviously you need the budget. When you approach chief financial officer uh, or CEO of the hospital and ask for money, you cannot say, well, I need you to allocate this and this amount of budget for something that cannot be defined. So our job is to try to define better what arts can do for health. And we have only started to do that recently. Um, arts and health is a concept associated today more than ever before with mental or behavioral health, especially in last year due to pandemic, as we all know. So before I proceed, I'd like to remind you that uh, mental health is going to be the global leading cause of mortality and morbidity by 2030. We associate our minds and consciousness with our brains. That's something that we might want to reconsider. This is how Leonardo saw the brain. And this is how I was taught the anatomy of the brain. It is strictly divided in geographical lobes. Now, thanks to technology, it's a 3D hologram of the brain. This is what we know now that the brain is. It's a bunch of interconnected bundles. And who knows what we will discover when we properly enter the sphere of energy, frequency, and vibration. That all being said, I think no matter how, how deep we go into anatomy of the brain, we will never, through images, realize the content of the brain. That's why I think arts is the original neuroimaging process. These words actually belong to my dear friend, art therapist, Michael Franklin. I was always wondering what is the mathematics of emotions and at which point testimonials become evidence. We are born to create. Why do we have to be deprived of it once we enter the healthcare systems? To me, amongst many definitions, arts uh, is a skilled form of creativity. So if we ask ourselves, do, do, arts, or do arts affect emotions? And do emotions affect health? The answer is yes, that means arts affect health. Now, let's go back to the reality we live in. Healthcare is a very regulated industry and hospitals are hard data driven institution. If arts wants to enter healthcare, it needs to learn to speak its language and show that it is an added value and not an extra cost. Uh, there are multiple ways how to do that. And I have extracted today the one that is developed at Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the United States. It's showing that improvement of healthcare system requires simultaneous pursuit of these three aims, improving patient experience of care, improving the health of populations, reducing per capita cost of health. So let's try to, through arts, help healthcare systems define their su success. Let's help healthcare systems improve the quality of care. A few years ago with Artisan, we did a simple case study and correlated research done in the area of arts and health, music, visual arts, and dance with these three aims. And today I'm going to just share a quick example of the study that was published in 2010 by Trevisan in Bologna, where they were assessing the um, impact of art contemplation on patients' adaptation to hospital rooms. And it, it proved to be influenced in a positive way. If you change the viewpoint of the problems of health care a little bit, these are the problems. And I can tell you they can all be addressed by bringing arts to hospital. Benefits can be viewed as clinical, and economic benefits of arts. Why would healthcare institutions invest in the arts? 
we all know most common question is why do you spend money on arts? Why don't you hire more people or buy CT? Well, it has huge benefit for patients, benefits for patients and families. And as Katsu also said, incredible benefits for healthcare staff. My journey started in, um, my journey of arts and health started in Cleveland, Ohio, United States. Um, so this is, a, this is an aerial view of Cleveland Clinic main campus. And we started a program called Arts and Medicine Institute there in 2008 with the premise that hospitals should embrace all forms of arts and make it service to patients, families, and employees. Related to art collection, I had incredible privilege to work with a unique group of three curators, Joanne Cohen, Bellamy Prince, and Jennifer Finkel, and their team who started art program in 2005. They developed the curatorial thread for the hospital and grew the collection to more than 7,000 original objects of art, more than 15,000 posters and prints, and very importantly, activated the collection by multiple programs and activities around it. The collection has commissioned and acquired pieces and you can find it on the website of the Cleveland Clinic Arts and Medicine. Now, the same team published a study in Health Environments Research and Design Journal about how that particular contemporary art collection influenced certain areas of mental health. So the question that I'm um, that they were asked respondents was, how would you say viewing the art collection at main campus affected your mood? The mood improved as a result of viewing for 72% of all respondents. What was I found also interesting is, the question was, how much does the artwork at main campus reflect culture diversity, 21st century, innovation, or healing environment? And you can see the mainly answers were very positive. There were also a list of 12 positive descriptors. Just by a quick look at this um, figure, you can see that most of the people saw the art collection as something very positive. And in, a, in the lieu of do not harm, a list of negative descriptors are here. And you can see majority of respondents did not associate art collection at all with anything negative. 78% of all respondents said the overall impression of the hospital was positively impacted by art collection. Now I have to share positive impact, which I experienced myself. This was many years ago, my, my children, my two daughters who were very tiny and like many other um, visitors and patients of the Cleveland Clinic interacted a lot with the video installation of Jennifer Steinkup and also by great installation of Dominic Lehman animating surface. I would have to say that video installations are very popular in, in hospitals. Now, my journey continued from USA to UAE. Together with Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi team and incredible local culture, we brought this ethos of the new arts and health concept. And we created an amazing environment, not just by appearance, but by diverse culture, great people, and fascinating history of the West Asia or Middle East, which made me aware of how much we don't know and is yet to be learned about this concept. A little walk um, through the hallways, Rana Begum, which Katsu also uh, mentioned, a beautiful work, and the work of Hassan Sharif. Um, I have to say at this point that many programs um, such as employee art shows where employees create art are showing and emphasizing that arts transcends any geographical language or cultural barrier or any material value. My journey took me further to Kochi, Kerala in India. Arts in a hospital is not a luxury or commodity. It's a very humble necessity and it belongs to everyone. This is a, a general hospital in Kochi. I was privileged again to work with great team from Kochi Biennale on the program for the hospital. And what you can see here is artist Daniel Connell from Australia, who created a series of portraits of the patients. Arts is allowing us to stop, reflect, and show that we actually deeply care.
And that is how we discover the beauty and the true value of the arts. These are the portraits in the hospital. I took this image three years ago in Gandhi Ashram in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad. Please take a few seconds to read it. I feel we are entering the period where arts can have an incredible impact on era we are living in. So I found it art to see. It is all about the time and how we use the time that is given to us. In healthcare, the perception of time is very different than perception of time in arts. As you know, healthcare workers, they don't have time to, to sleep, to eat, to breathe. We know that very well. Hospitals are places where joy and sorrow meet. And that can be portals of our existence where we reset our values. Take a look at this photo. I think Katz, you showed that before. I'll take a step back. Do you know what this is? This is prison. We cannot afford in the future to hospitals feel people like they're in prison. So imagine if all healthcare organizations use the arts to reduce anxiety, fear, and fatigue while providing inspiration and hope to recover and renew. The arts alone will not cure cancer or prevent strokes, but they significantly improve the care experience and creating such environments is within our reach. Let us find the wisdom, creativity, compassion, and commitment to make this happen in our communities and throughout the world. Arts and health are two most cohesive forces of humanity in 21st century. We have a third one, which is internet and digital era. So if we merge all three in one, we have a very powerful tool that can serve the humanity in a very unique way. And that is why I created Artisan Digital Telehealth Platform. But that is to be told at some other gathering. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. That was great. So interesting and really nice to see an experience of, um, you know, an international experience and not just of the UK. So we are going to take a break now. We have a 15 minute break in which we will be seeing the film of Peter Liversidge, uh, which features, as I said before, uh, Phil Jupitus, the comedian Phil Jupitus, reading NHS related jokes. So we will see you in 15 minutes, uh, just about five before four. Thank you very much. On his rounds, the doctor asked the nurse, how is that little boy doing, the one who swallowed all those pound coins? Nurse answered, no change yet. An artist asked his gallerist if there'd been any interest in the works in his current exhibition. I've got good news and bad news, replied the gallery owner. The good news is that a gentleman inquired about your work and wondered whether it would appreciate in value after your death. When I told him it would, he bought the entire show. That's great, exclaimed the artist. But what's the bad news? The man was your doctor. You know you've been a nurse too long when you know how to say bedpan in five different languages. Four surgeons were on a coffee break. The first said, I like operating on librarians best because you open them up and everything is in alphabetical order. The second said, I think accountants are the easiest to operate on because everything inside is numbered. The third said, I prefer electricians because everything is colour coded. And the fourth said, I reckon lawyers are the easiest to operate on because they're heartless, spineless, gutless, and their head and rear end are interchangeable. How is a hospital gown like insurance? You're never covered as much as you think you are. I took my husband to the hospital yesterday to have 17 stitches removed. That'll teach him to buy me a sewing kit for my birthday. A God-fearing man was close to death in hospital, so his family called in the vicar. As the vicar stood by the bed, the man's condition seemed to deteriorate and he motioned frantically for something to write on. The vicar handed him a pen and paper and he quickly scribbled a note. No sooner had he finished writing than he died. The vicar left the note unread for three quarters of an hour while the family came to terms with their grief. But as he prepared to leave the hospital, he said, 
I think now would be an appropriate time to read Bill's last note. It was obviously something which meant a lot to him. Something he felt he needed to say. The vicar opened the piece of paper and read aloud. Hey you, you're standing on my oxygen tube. A man took his pregnant wife to the hospital to give birth. There, the doctor revealed that he developed an experimental machine which could take some of the pain of childbirth from the mother and give it to the father instead. He asked the couple whether they were interested in giving it a try, and they agreed. Since the machine was largely untested, the doctor thought it wise to start at the lowest setting. He strapped the man down, switched on the machine and asked him whether he could feel any pain. No, I feel fine. So the doctor turned the machine to a slightly higher setting. Again, the man reported feeling no discomfort. And all the while, the wife was going through pain-free childbirth. Greatly encouraged, the doctor turned the machine to its highest setting. Still, the man felt no pain. This is truly amazing, said the doctor excitedly. A veritable breakthrough in childbirth. After his wife had given birth, the husband climbed off the machine and calmly drove home. There, he found the postman dead on the doorstep. A woman in labour with her first child yelled repeatedly, Shouldn't, wouldn't, didn't. Don't, couldn't, mustn't, can't. Her worried husband asked the doctor what the problem was. Nothing to worry about, said the doctor. Your wife is in the throes of contractions. I was born by caesarean section, but not so you'd noticed. It's just when I leave the house, I go out through the window. A man phoned the hospital in a state of excitement. My wife is pregnant. Her contractions are only two minutes apart. The doctor said, is this her first child? No, you idiot, the man replied. This is her husband. When a trick went wrong, an amateur magician accidentally turned his wife into a couch and his two children into armchairs. He tried everything he knew to reverse the trick, but when all attempts failed, he took them to hospital. He paced up and down in casualty for hours until finally a junior doctor came out to see him. My wife is a couch and my two children are armchairs, said the magician. I need to know they're how they're doing. The doctor glanced at his notes and said, Ah, uh, well, they're comfortable. Who are most stable people in hospital, the ultrasound department. A patient who had just undergone a very complicated operation kept complaining that he could feel some sort of bump on his head and he had a pounding headache. Since the operation had been on his stomach, these were not the type of side effects that the nursing staff had anticipated. Fearing that he might be suffering from post-operative shock, one of the nurses mentioned the symptoms to the surgeon who carried out the operation. Don't worry, said the surgeon. It's not shock. He really does have a bump on his head. Halfway through the operation, we ran out of anaesthetic. What's the difference between a haematologist and a urologist? The haematologist pricks your finger. I wasn't originally going to get a brain transplant, but then I changed my mind. A woman went to hospital to visit a friend who hadn't been at a hospital for several years and a very, was very ignorant about all the new technology. A technician followed her into the elevator, wheeling a large, intimidating-looking machine with numerous tubes, wires and dials. She looked at it and smiled. I certainly wouldn't want to be hooked up to that. Neither would I, replied the technician. It's the floor cleaner. A man ended up in hospital covered in wood and hay with a toy horse lodged in his rear end. Doctors described his condition as stable. A man was lying in a hospital covered in bandages from head to toe. The guy in the next bed said, what do you do for a living? The bandage man replied, I used to be a window cleaner. Oh, and when did you give it up? About halfway down. A man went to A&E and told the triage nurse, a wasp has given me a nasty sting. Is there something that you can give me? Whereabouts is it? Asked the nurse. I don't know, asked the man. It'll be miles away by now. A man lost both ears in an accident and was distraught at the prospect of being unable to hear ever again. The surgeon told him, there are no human transplant ears available at present, but we do have a dog's ear and a pig's ear that are ready to transplant. Would you consider those? Yes, OK, replied the patient. I'll try anything to save my hearing. So the transplants went ahead, and a month later the man returned to the hospital for a check. How have things been? asked the surgeon. Well, doctor, the dog's ear is brilliant. I can hear for miles, but with a pig's ear I seem to be getting a bit of crackling. Two small boys were sitting outside a clinic. One was crying very loudly. What's the matter? asked the other boy. I came here for a blood test. So? There's nothing to be afraid of. You don't understand. For the blood test, they cut my finger. Hearing this, the second boy started to cry too. 
Why are you crying? sobbed the first boy. Because I'm here for a urine test. Two women were bemoaning the state of the NHS. One said, do you know, my 93-year-old mother has been waiting over a year for her operation. That is appalling, said the other woman. What a terrible way to treat someone of that age. I know, said the first woman. It got so bad that at one point I even said to her, Mum, do you really need these breast enlargements? Pacing the hospital corridor, a man was growing anxious about his imminent operation. His partner asked him, What's the matter? Why are you getting so worked up? He replied, I heard one of these nurses say it's a very simple operation. Don't worry, I'm sure it'll be all right. She was just trying to comfort you, said his partner. What's so frightening about that? She was talking to the surgeon. A man was visiting a friend in hospital. He'd recently quit smoking and was chewing on an unlit cigar when he stepped into the lift. A staff member told him firmly, Sir, there is no smoking in this hospital. I'm not smoking, lady, replied the man. But you have a cigar in your mouth. Yes, and I'm wearing jockey shorts, but I'm not riding a horse. When a patient regained consciousness after an operation, the surgeon told her, I'm really sorry, but I'm afraid we're going to have to open you up again. You see, unfortunately, I left my rubber gloves inside you. The patient said, well, if that's all it is, I'd prefer you leave me alone and I'll buy you a new pair. A man went to his doctor and said, doctor, I keep having visions of the future. When did these start? asked the doctor. Next Thursday, replied the patient. Apparently, overthinking or worrying about things may actually keep your brain healthier. You know, that means if you're not a worrier, you should be worried about that. My neighbour's in a coma. He's living the dream. My friend was told by her doctor that she is morbidly obese, as if she doesn't have enough on her plate. Two men at work were just discussing the dangers of smoking. The first said, just one cigarette killed my mate. Really? Yes, he was fixing a gas leak at the time. Doing rounds, a new nurse couldn't help overhearing the surgeon yelling, Typhoid! Tetanus! Measles! Why does he keep doing that? she asked a colleague. Oh, he likes to call the shots round here. A man went to the doctor and said, Doctor, I keep calling out the names of characters from Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit in the middle of the night. What is the matter with me? The doctor said, It sounds to me as if you've been Tolkien in your sleep. A guy was lying in his hospital bed, wired up with drips and monitors, breathing with the aid of an oxygen mask. A young woman was going round the ward with the tea trolley. When she reached his bed, she asked him, Is there anything you would like? Yes, he answered. Could you tell me if my testicles are black? I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not medical staff, she replied. I can't help you with that. Oh, please, have a look, he begged. I'm worried. Are my testicles black? Taking pity on his obvious distress, the woman glanced around the ward and seeing no sign of any medical staff said, all right, I'll have a look for you. So she pulled back the bed cover and probed around his genitals, had a good long look and said to him, no, they seem fine to me. In some agitation, the patient immediately pulled off his oxygen mask and shouted, what are you doing? I just wanted to know, are my test results back? Doctor, doctor, I keep thinking I'm a clock. Try not to get so wound up. After examining a male patient, a doctor took the man's wife to one side. I must be honest with you, said the doctor in an ominous tone. I don't like the look of your husband. <laughs> Me neither, she said, but he brings home a good wage and he's great with the kids. A newspaper proprietor went to the doctor and said, Doctor, I'm really worried. My paper has lost 50,000 readers over the past year. Right, said the doctor, I'll prescribe you some tablets. What use will they be? Well, they'll help improve your circulation. Doctor, doctor, I think I may be suffering from deja vu. Didn't I see you yesterday? What happened when two meteorologists each broke an arm and a leg in an accident? There was worry about the forecasts. A completely unqualified man got a job as a cosmetic surgeon. <laughs> that raised a few eyebrows. The psychiatrist told the genie that his emotions were all bottled up. I got kicked out of the hospital. Apparently, the sign that reads stroke patients here meant something completely different. Two campers were hiking through the woods when one was bitten on the rear end by a rattlesnake. I'll go into town for a doctor, the other one said. 
He ran miles to a small town and finally, the only doctor delivering was delivering a baby. I can't leave, the doctor said, but here's what you do. Take a knife, cut a little cross where the bite is, suck out the poison and spit it on the ground. The bloke runs back to his friend who's in agony. What did the doctor say, said the victim. He says you're going to die. A bloke tells his psychiatrist, every time I get into bed, I think there's somebody under it. Come to me three weeks, three times a week for two years and I'll cure your fears, said the shrink, and I'll only charge you £200 a visit. The bloke thinks about it. Six months later, he runs into the doctor who asks why he never came back. For £200 a visit, he says, a bartender cured me for a tenner. Is that so, says the psychiatrist, how? He came round and he cut the legs off my bed. While dancing at a party, I tripped and stubbed my toe. Days later, my toe was swollen and purple. I went to see a podiatrist. I told him how I'd hurt myself and admitting to feeling foolish at being so clumsy. After x-raying my toe, the doctor said he didn't need to do anything. Anxious to speed the healing, I asked whether there was something that I could do. Should I soak it, put it on ice? Is there anything that you would recommend? The doctor smiled and said, take a course of dancing lessons for eight weeks. A woman was pregnant with her first child and her husband was about to leave on a two-week business trip. When she went to her doctor's appointment, she had some questions. My husband wants me to ask you something, she began timidly and looked embarrassed. The doctor interrupted her. I get asked that question all the time, she said in a reassuring tone. Intimacy with your husband is fine until late in the pregnancy. No, that's not it, an embarrassed expectant mother confessed. My husband wants to know if he can still mow the lawn. It had been a long time, seven years to be exact, since my friend had been to see his doctor. So the receptionist told him that if he wanted to make an appointment, he would have to be reprocessed as a new patient. All right, he said, reprocess me. I'm sorry, she told him, we're not accepting any new patients. A woman called her doctor up and said, Doctor, doctor, I just swallowed a spoon, what should I do? The doctor says, sit down, don't stir. I mixed up the cardiac resuscitation equipment with the lie detector but I will defib you later. Wounds heal better if they are covered. This is an example of gauze and effect. I don't understand the point of acupuncture. My wife is feeling better after getting her appendix removed. Unfortunately, she will never be able to reference this chapter of her life. This year's flu is going viral. After a woman gave birth, the doctor appeared in the ward with a worried expression and announced, I must tell you something about your baby, she said. The woman sat bolt upright. What's wrong with my baby? The doctor replied, well, nothing is wrong exactly, just a bit different. You see, your baby is a hermaphrodite. A hermaphrodite, repeated the new mother. What's that? It means that your baby has the features of a male and a female. The mother turned pale. You mean the baby has a penis and a brain? A GP said, so you think you're a moth? Well, instead of coming to me, why don't you consult a psychiatrist? I would have, said the patient, but your light was on. When I got an inoculation, it was like a shot in the arm. Yesterday, I accidentally swallowed some food colouring. The doctor says I'm OK, but I feel like I've died a little inside. Did you hear about the two podiatrists? They became arch rivals. Hello again. Uh, welcome back. Um, I want to thank... Eva, again, for that really rich panorama of showing us art around, around the world in hospitals. And now I'm delighted to hand over to Daniel Heather, who, as I said, is the deputy archivist um, at Bart's Health NHS Trust. And he will be talking about art and collecting in the pre-NHS hospital. Daniel, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just like to begin by thanking uh, Katsu for the invitation to speak today. Um, thank the other speakers and obviously uh, also thank everybody who's taken the time out this afternoon <clears throat> to attend. Um, I hope it proves interesting. I'd like to begin by providing an overview of today's presentation. I'll begin by briefly explaining the function of Bart's Health NHS Trust Archives and Museums, which is the service I work for and explore how artworks fit within our larger collection. I'll then go on to consider the motivations for hospitals and their attendant medical colleges acquiring and displaying artwork with a focus on the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries, including the period of transition in the 1940s when the NHS was created 
in earlier funding models that sustained hospitals up to that point were phased out. I believe the artworks in our collection can be used as a lens that allows us to consider why it was important for pre-NHS hospitals to engage with a curatorial and collecting impulse, and how this impulse was intrinsic to the maintenance of financial, social, and institutional well-being for these healthcare entities. I'll use artworks from our collection throughout the talk on these slides. All the images are courtesy of Bart's Health NHS Trust Archives and Museums, unless otherwise noted. I'll argue that the relationship between visual art and well-being was understood in a radically different way to the broader consensus that arrived with us in the mid 20th century and highlight that many of the artworks acquired by pre-NHS hospitals, as records form part of our archive and museum collections, were never intended for consumption by patients. Instead, the works were often situated in parts of the hospital estate that were quasi-private and only accessible to staff, medical students and governors. However, I'll also use the photographic archives in our care to demonstrate that art was, on occasion, also displayed in wards and recreational spaces too, an act that predicts the work of 20th century art and wellbeing practitioners. Although these images only provide a partial insight, I'll attempt to draw out some commonalities between historic practice and the activities one might encounter in the NHS today. I'll begin by providing a little more context about Bart's Health Archives and Museums. Our collection is largely comprised of the archives, which is to say the institutional records of around 30 hospitals and healthcare organisations that are or were active in East London and the City of London. Our largest collections relate to St Bartholomew's Hospital, which was founded in 1123, and the London Hospital, now the Royal London Hospital, founded in 1740. Over 95% of the collection consists of archive records retained for their informational or evidential value, or clinical objects retained not for their aesthetic properties, but because of their function and what, they, and what they tell us about the history of medicine. The collection of visual art we hold, which predominantly consists of painting and sculpture, is an element of the collection that has not, to date, been comprehensively researched or well used, save for occasional inquiries by researchers interested in producing biographies of individual artists, or portrait sitters who are captured in some of these works. Often the provenance of the artworks and their chain of custody are only partially understood by us. We've attempted to reconstruct the active lives of these artworks through surviving committee minutes, photographs where the artworks are often an incidental inclusion in a shot, or insurance, in, or insurance valuations held in the archives. We're confident that the artworks we hold represent a fraction of those originally held by these pre-NHS institutions, with multiple works having been, having been discarded, lost, stolen, or inadvertently destroyed during hospital closures or major building works over countless decades before they passed into our custody as a distinct managed collection. The partial and incomplete history of these works often complicates making clear pronouncements on their function, their display history, and the events that led to their acquisition. In this respect, my presentation is, as much as anything else, an exploratory dive into a part of the collection that would benefit from more sustained study by art historians or others interested in the history of health and visual arts. The artworks in our collection include paintings, sculpture, drawings, and some fixed architectural assets dating from around 1650 to 1982. Thematically, the works fall into two very broad categories, secular works that tend to capture the likenesses of distinguished clinicians, governors, and patrons, or explicitly religious works. The tradition of situating religious works within healthcare settings and a historic correlation between spiritual succor and physical well-being is, of course, a well-established trope, one that's been written about extensively. Today, I'll be focusing largely on, what, on works that fall into the former category, as I think these provide us with more insight into the specific mechanics or drivers for collecting and curating activities in the pre-NHS hospital. I'd like to use the next few images as case studies to better explore the collecting and curating impulse. 
This painting of Tom's Blizzard is indicative of many of the works in our custody. Blizzard was a surgeon at the London Hospital in Whitechapel and had trained at both the London and St Bartholomew's. Most of the works we hold serve the conventional purpose of commemoration and, in the case of the hospital's governors, a flattery. At this point, it's important to understand the relationship between the production and display of such works and the hospital's governance and finance model. Both St Bartholomew's and the London Hospital operated as so-called voluntary hospitals, with care delivered free of charge to a deserving poor. Before the creation of the NHS, healthcare in England was a patchy and complex affair, with private hospitals that collected fees from patients, 19th century workhouse infirmaries that were administered under the poor law and provided care to those living in workhouses, and voluntary hospitals. The bulk of our art collection belong to healthcare organisations that come under this third category of the voluntary hospital. These hospitals were largely funded by charitable donations, thus some also relied on historic endowments and investments in property and land. The mission of the voluntary hospitals was significant, with some figures suggesting they were providing a third of all hospital beds by the early 20th century. Their philanthropic activity, particularly in the Georgian and Victorian era, is emblematic of the wider transition from the use of posthumous bequests to fund parochial and civic charities towards the popularization of a newer form of direct charitable engagement undertaken by people of means during their life. Reliant as these hospitals were on the income received by annual subscriptions and operating in a fiercely competitive market with other charitable bodies, the use of artworks to signpost the involvement of notable individuals and to adorn areas of the hospital estate designed for gatherings of gentlemen of extensive charity, as they're described in the records of St Bartholomew's, was a compelling reason for undertaking collection building and curatorial activities. In parallel, their respective medical colleges, which provided training for aspiring physicians and surgeons, also functioned within a competitive market, in a picture that's not radically dissimilar to consumer-led models of higher education that we find in the UK today. The reliance of these hospitals on charitable giving to finance their activities would remain a feature right up until the creation of the NHS in 1948. Sidney Holland, the second Viscount Nutsford, who was chairman of the London Hospital between 1896 and 1931, and who was immortalised in a number of paintings and sculptures in our collection, was known in the popular press as the Prince of Beggars on account of his tireless work to promote the activity of the hospital and attract new funders to support his cause, including the use of emerging media technology like radio to promote his fundraising work. As both a celebrity philanthropist and celebrity fundraiser, Holland's portraits epitomise the use of visual art by the hospital as part of a broader media strategy to celebrate existing supporters and to attract new patrons. The positive financial correlation between celebrity and philanthropy extends to clinical staff at the hospitals too. This painting of Sir Frederick Treves was gifted to the London Hospital Medical College in 1896 and is still displayed in Whitechapel today. As well as being the first surgeon to perform an appendicectomy in England, he was already well known by the 1890s for his relationship with Joseph Merrick, the so-called elephant man, who spent the last years of his life as a patient at the London Hospital. Much like Viscount Nutsford, the hospital exploited its relationship with this high-profile figure, displaying a number of portraits of Treves across the hospital estate. In this sense, we might begin to see the potent role that art played in the construction and maintenance of the hospital's successful social and financial life, and the position of art in solidifying a sense of institutional well-being. The most notable instrument instance of the confluence between art, institutional power and philanthropy is the Hogarth Stair and Great Hall in the north wing of St Bartholomew's Hospital. By the early 1700s, St Bartholomew's Hospital had occupied the same site in Smithfield for almost six centuries. The layout of its buildings, arranged around courtyards and closes, still dated mainly from medieval times, but many of the structures were in disrepair and were inadequate to cope with the sick and injured who needed treatment. The, governor of Saint, the governors of St Bartholomew's resolved to build a completely new hospital on the existing site, with a cost to be met from voluntary subscriptions, 
that is donations from wealthy individuals. Plans were submitted by James Gibbs, a distinguished architect and himself a governor, and approved in May 1729. There would be four separate blocks arranged symmetrically around a square. Three of the four blocks contained patient wards, but the north wing was to contain a compting or counting house with the conduct of hospital business, a residence for the clerk, a room for the admission and discharge of patients, and on the first floor, the great hall, which would be used to host governor's meetings and events, and which was reached by a staircase featuring two large stretched canvases by William Hogarth. Whilst much of the discussion around Hogarth's painting of Christ at the Pool of Bethesda, which appears on the stairs alongside a painting of the Good Samaritan, has focused on the historical accuracy of the illnesses depicted therein, or the likelihood that the models were drawn from the contemporaneous patient population of St. Bartholomew's Hospital, it's also worth considering the material circumstances that led to the paintings being commissioned and the intended audience for these works as envisaged by the hospital. Hogarth, who produced the works free of charge, enjoyed a personal relationship with the hospital, recognized the potential for growing his reputation by, and I quote, succeeding in what the puffers in books call the great style of history painting, a radical departure from his more familiar practice. As a largely administrative building, the intended audience of the works were existing and potential donors to the hospital. And it seems clear that the hospital's governors hoped such a spectacular staircase would have the suitable effect of both wowing the wealthy and appealing to their sense of Christian duty and charity. The Hogarth stair leads to the Great Hall, formerly used as a meeting place by the hospital's governors. Of particular note are the donor plaques visible on the walls of this space, which record the names of individuals who funded the redevelopment of the hospital site. Whilst in more recent decades, the function of this space has radically changed, and there's been a concerted effort to use the space for staff wellbeing events during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's worthwhile to know that the first large scale site specific work commissioned at the hospital con was conceived with radically different intentions to those of my colleagues who work in art and health commissioning today. As the oldest hospital in the UK and one radically, rapidly approaching its 900th anniversary in 2023, St. Bartholomew's Hospital might be characterized as an outlier. But the use of site-specific works in quasi-private spaces is also apparent in the pre-NHS art commissioning activities of the London Hospital in Whitechapel, which was established in 1740. In 1912, the Japanese painter Ishibashi Kazunori was commissioned to paint 36 panels in the dining room of the London Hospital Medical College, a social space used by the students and officers of the medical school. This image is taken from the American Magazine of Art, July 1917, and is one of the few photographic records of this work that we're aware of. Unfortunately, its fate after World War II seems unclear, with conflicting reports of it having been sold or lost. Much like the Hogarth work at St. Bartholomew's, this artwork was conceived as a means of demonstrating the hospital's prosperity and served the function of beautifying an area of the hospital estate used exclusively by members of the college community for formal dining events. The work also demonstrated the growing ambition of the hospital in commissioning works and diversifying its art holdings, which to that point had largely consisted of portraiture and figurative sculpture. At the beginning of my presentation, I suggested that the archive also provides some insights into the use of art in a way that predicts the later emergence of art and well-being initiatives in the 20th century when art began to be acquired or displayed with the specific intention of supporting patients' physical and mental health. Sheridan Russell's painting in Hospitals Initiative, which began at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in 1959, is generally recognized as the first instance of such activity. However, there are also indica indications that the positive relationship between art and health was understood amongst the hospitals whose historic archives we manage. To do this, I'm drawing from the photographs in our archive collection, which offer clues as to how art was used in patient-facing areas. 
This photograph of Mary Ward at the London Hospital shows a number of paintings or prints that are displayed between beds, jostling for space amid curtain racks and medical notes. There are also a number of artworks visible on the far wall of this space. As I mentioned, the remaining art collection in our care represents only a small fraction of the works we believe were originally held by the hospital. And in the absence of detailed written inventories of artwork in wards, it's very challenging to identify precisely what these works might have been and what the cura curatorial intention was behind their placement. The images largely seem to be landscapes or genre paintings, perhaps selected for their calming properties. Whitechapel was marked by extreme poverty and overcrowded slum housing by 1900, and it's likely that landscapes and the like would have provided an escape from the challenging realities of everyday existence. We might also argue that the sentimental nature of such works, with their strong pull on the viewer's emotion, was well suited to a hospital that relied on a philanthropic model for its continuing existence. This image, which also comes from the London Hospital, allows us to consider the role of artworks in patient areas in relationship to the notion of domesticity. Contemporary art and health discourse often addresses the intimidating nature of institutional spaces, which can often seem alien and unfriendly, with practitioners focusing on work that renders these clinical spaces more familiar. Looking at early 20th century images, it's noticeable to see how a similar strategy is displayed, displayed is deployed, sorry, with visual art, decorative objects like vases, and cut flowers being used around the chimney piece and nurse's station. Of course, the domestic interior these items evoke is probably closer to that of the middle class drawing room or study, which whilst familiar to many patients, would not be like their own homes, but more likely those of their employers. Usefully, a number of postcards from the same period as these photographs give us a better indication of the colour schemes and decorative motifs used in wards at this point in time. This com these commemorative postcards are themselves a manifestation of the hospital's fundraising activities, being a saleable, artistic, collectible object in their own right. The image challenges some assumptions about hospitals of the past being entirely white spaces devoid of decoration or visual interest, a development that probably owes more to a changing understanding of infection control and hygiene in the mid 20th century, alongside a great push towards standardization of appearance in healthcare environments. This image of Rahir Ward, named after the Anglo-Norman priest and courtier who founded St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 1123, is striking as one of the few examples where we can definitely identify the artwork on display as one that still sits within our collection. Until relatively recently, it had been the practice to name hospital wards after notable individuals. We might contend that Rahir's bust is used in this ward to indicate the longevity of the hospital, its unwavering commitment to healthcare, and to essentially reassure the patient that they are in safe and competent hands. Taken together, these images in the last few slides all point to a recognition of the role art could play in patient welfare. Although display decisions arguably lack the patient responsive or empathetic element of contemporary activity, and the placement of artwork can seem arbitrary at times. There is another area, however, where we might also claim a compelling link between historic and contemporary practice, that being the relationship between staff well-being and the arts. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the role of staff welfare into sharper relief particularly in the healthcare sector. Recognition of the role that spaces for reflection and recovery can play and the role of art in that process has risen in significance and seen spaces at my employer, Bart's Health NHS Trust, repurposed for these activities. Throughout the 19th and early 20th century, many hospital students and staff lived in and as such, the hospital estate tended to contain designated spaces the rest, recuperation, and social activity. These photographs inevitably include artworks, suggesting an understanding of the role art could play in supporting clinical staff well-being. As hospital sites have been adapted and modernized, and as staff have begun to live elsewhere and commute to work, fewer spaces like this are available. 
Recent activities such as Vital Arts Hashtag 100 NHS Rooms program, which Katsu spoke about earlier, has began to bring new artworks to soft spaces across the hospital and might be seen in some ways as a revival of this historic practice. Opportunities for staff to unlock their own creativity have also seen a more recent revival with an exhibition of staff works at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 2020, reviving similar activity from the 1930s, which is pictured here. Our archives similarly capture a long history of dramatic and musical performances by staff members, which we might argue find a contemporary resonance in the song and dance routines that are often shared on social media platforms by staff members today. One of the questions left unanswered is what role, if any, these artworks in our collection play in the contemporary hospital. Are the themes they explore or the media they're created in fundamentally antithetical to contemporary art and well-being activity? Inevitably, these works present significant challenges. Contemporary hospital spaces are seldom designed to accommodate oil paintings on walls or plinths for sculptures. Similarly, the sits in many of the paintings are unrecognizable to contemporary patients, to staff, and to the wider population. And it's fair to say that they're hugely unrepresentative of the communities that these hospitals serve today. Whilst a proportion of the works in our custody continue to be on display, they are often in heritage buildings on the estate, which means that although they're visible to some people who come onto the hospital, they remain invisible to many other patients and visitors who are attending the site for healthcare purposes alone. It remains a live question for arts practitioners to consider how these works might be activated in the present and how they might speak to our contemporary audiences and to other contemporary artworks that are displayed throughout the hospital. Rather than concluding with a neat answer, I would invite artists, researchers, and cultural producers to consider these issues. And I'd encourage anybody to get in touch with us if they're interested in exploring this collection further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. That was really nice, very interesting to, to see some continuity as well as some rupture in the attitudes to art and hospital context, but also the ideas around um, audience is really interesting how, how it shifts. Um, it's really good to have another panorama and kind of a grounding in history of, of what we're, we're doing today. Thank you. So uh, now I'd like to hand over to Peter Liversidge, who, as I previously said, uh, is a internationally acclaimed artist, but also has uh, a lot of his practice intersects with the NHS. And he will tell you all about it now. Thank you, Katsu. And thank you, uh, Daniel Neva as well. And, and Thank you again, Katsu, for inviting me to be part of today. I'm going to talk about two projects today. Um, uh, later, or in seven minutes, I'll be talking about sign paintings for the NHS, which was my uh, work made in response to um, the pandemic uh, last year. But the first I'll speak about is uh, Proposals for the Royal London Hospital, which was a work commissioned in 2012 uh, by Vital Arts. And, I'm just going to talk a bit about how that process works. I, with a lot of projects, all my projects start with uh, research. So I spent a lot of time um, in the archives and walking the building, walking the, the sort of land around what was then the Royal London Hospital, which um, was coming to the end of its life as a building. Uh, and then the, as you'll see in the photograph on the left-hand side of, of your screen, um, in the front there is the archive museum building and in the background is the new hospital. And I spent a lot of time looking through the archives, trying to find information, um, looking for clues as to what the hospital was. I mean, it's, it's very interesting that Daniel ended with the context, you know, contextualizing work within the um, uh, uh, now in the now as far as how we we look and we look to respond to a space such as a hospital um so i started by being in the archive talking to members of staff um, observing spending time uh, it coincided with my youngest son uh, needing stitches so i spent time in a e as well and then as i went around the building and as the building sort of passed over to the new space, we got to spend time in a lot of the different rooms that constituted the, the hospital as they were closed down for renovation and then 
um, as they are now. And one of them was a, a, a room that had a, a, a lasting effect. And it's, it's some, something that Katsu spoke about at the start as well was um, that it was the room that Joseph, Joseph Merrick uh, was given. And coincidentally, this room was right next to um, nurses' quarters um, in the, this is post his life, um, in the uh, sort of uh, early uh, sort of 19th, 20th century. Um, and what was very interesting was when I went into this room, there's a very surreal space behind the clock face, which was um, obviously public facing sort of civic duty to have a clock face facing the street, letting people know the time and also obviously in relation to visiting the hospital, being on time for your appointment. But um, to the right of this clock face was a ladder and Joseph Merrick uh, would climb this ladder and spend time on the roof, uh, looking down on the very street where he was once uh, an object, object of curiosity himself when he was publicly paraded um, as a, well, as in the, the, the uh, language of the time as a, as, a, as a professional freak. And it was all this work, all the, the look at the archive, the conversations I was having that, that led into the work that was commissioned by Vital Arts that became proposals for the Royal London Hospital, which was um, made, uh, all the proposals were written um, between uh, October and November 2012. And the writing of those proposals is always done on a, um, a manual typewriter. And the reason I choose a manual typewriter is because of its direct relationship with the paper, very much like a, a pencil or a pen or a, uh, uh, has a relationship with the paper if you're making a drawing or if you're uh, sculpting or making other uh, works. It's very much about that direct, direct relationship and making that sort of permanent Mark and one of the pieces that um, Katsu talked about when she spoke earlier was the collecting of the paint, the Georgian paint, which then, like some of the other works I'll show you in a moment for for our project, um, that work, sorry, that collected paint became a work within a frame that was the the, the proposal for that work was contained within the same frame. So the proposals themselves are. Um, their descriptions, they're not prescriptive, so they describe work. So when the work exists in its context, in its frame and in the hospital, it's about personal interpretation and very much about inviting others in. So it's not about, it's not a passive um, observation. It's not like looking at a sculpture or a painting. It's very much about inviting that audience and those, you know, that audience being um, uh, members of public or members of staff who, um, who used the hospital and used the hospital for you know what it was intended for so they're sort of co-conspirators or uh, co-authors and they engage with the work in the way that they find it and the work is found on the 11th floor which is the aau um uh, uh, wards which is the acute admissions unit so it's, it's the sort of interface with the hospital if um, it's, it's basically after you've been to A&E or if you've been to A&E and you need a short stay, it, it sort of manages before, manages that uh, patient before they are then um, taken to another ward or hopefully discharged. And the works themselves very much responded to that research, but also those sort of overheard conversations and, and how the work can exist. For example, the, the work in the center of the screen now um, is a proposal proposing that the, the proposal frame has a a slot in the top uh, that coins are passed through and so it's very much that people can come into the space they can internalize the work but also they can add to the work and change the work too very much like that the, the sort of paint flex or the you know the coins being something that can be added and can and so consequently instead of the work being static it can change and and this is a work i don't know if i can say this but this is a work unfortunately that does very often get um repurposed as in that uh, it gets taken off the wall forcibly and then the, the, the frame is broken apart and then the, the money is taken. And so every time that happens, we replace the work and the work then has this new life, this sort of uh, new uh, interaction with those uh, around it. And the work itself is not just on the 11th floor, there is also the, the proposal book. And the proposal book is a collation of the, the 66 proposals written for the Royal London Hospital. And that is very much about those individuals who want to you know, have the book, whether it was distributed to members of staff and uh, is available for members of the public, that it's about interacting again with the work you know, as, a, you know, as, a, as an individual and one-to-one. -one. There's nothing more uh, personal, obviously, than, than a book. And this was the first realized work, as it is one of the proposals that 
we realised vital arts and I. And then other works included um, instant uh, photographic pairs of the 14th floor uh, before it was fitted out. Um, and then also, as you have also just seen, the, the jokes um, that we collected from members of staff, uh, which first of all, before the, um, we filmed Phil Jupiter's uh, performing those jokes, um, Phil um, performed those jokes uh, at uh, Tate Modern in 2017. Um, and he, um, he adapted those jokes as he went along. So the jokes that you've just heard are from members of staff collated and collected from um, and selected by members of NHS staff. And uh, the proposals themselves, I just wanted to, to tell you that um, at the top of the header, so the, the proposals have a, a header at the top, and it's very important that um, the proposal is for the staff and patients at the Royal London Hospital. So it's that invitation to, to spend time and imagine a work or works. And it's very much not about my vision of what the work potentially could be or how I depict that work being, but actually a little bit like a live performance, Phil's live performance, it's how that evolving relationship with an audience or with the audience uh, evolves for and, and with a work. Now, the second piece that I wanted to talk about um, is not directly linked to uh, Royal London, but it has an uh, overriding link, obviously, to the NHS, which is a piece made uh, last year uh, at the beginning of the first lockdown of the uh, pandemic. And it's a piece called Sign Painters for the NHS. And this is my um, eldest son, George, um, holding the first sign that I had made. And, and, and this work was really, I didn't quite know. I didn't quite know why I was making the signs, if I'm perfectly honest, at first. Um, it wasn't a proposal-based project. Um, my youngest son had just come back from a French trip in mid-March and came back and then had classic coronavirus symptoms. So we were in lockdown from the 15th of March and it became something that I'd read and heard about and thought about through looking at, at the news and because of my over-interest in archives and, and material and, and wanting to know, I'd researched previous pandemics and having as everyone knows, we had an awful lot of time to do things like that, that I didn't quite know why I was making these signs, but very gradually it became clear that I wanted to um, to show solidarity with those on the front line, you know, whether they're bin men or postmen and women, uh, bus drivers, shop workers, social care workers, care home staff, um, and of course, frontline NHS staff and key workers, you know, teachers, um, you know, the, everyone who was throughout the pandemic were there for us. And so, this um, process that began on um, April the 6th became a daily process of, of coming to the studio and making signs, sign paintings for the NHS, um, which then over the seven weeks um, that the work was made, um, every day I would make the signs, I'd dry the signs in the studio, um, sometimes using a hair dryer or um, with all the windows open and I then install them under the cover of darkness. Um, and at first I didn't want any recognition. I didn't want this to be an artist project making or an artist making work about the pandemic. As I said, it was very much about that idea of showing solidarity. But one morning I was there and just checking that nothing had fallen down overnight as it had been really windy. And there was a, um, an, a, a photographer there from Reuters and Reuters, he just came up to me and said, oh, you know, you know what do you think to this? And I said, well, you know, it's great or I think I said it was okay and he said oh do you, you know do you have any idea who did it and 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 I was able to say to him actually it was me and my son and this is my youngest son Thomas who also in the beginning as um, he helped to make the signs and it was something that we worked on together sometimes I'd go into the or more often I'd be in the studio four or five hours and then he'd join me for an hour and then we'd take the signs back home and then when it got dark we go out and install those um, signs as as the work on, uh, sort of evolved and and became the thing that it became and what was interesting for me was that it started out not being a piece of work and then it very much became the thing that made sense of that early part of the first lockdown for me that it became about thanking others and being aware that others were doing things that potentially I or others wouldn't be prepared to do themselves. And what was interesting was I'd be out after night. Now I have a dog, but I met lots of dog walkers then who were saying, oh, what are you doing? And they'd start supporting my, supporting the project by bringing me gaffer tape and cable ties and boxes from things they'd been ordering from various online retailers. 
uh, and things. So it was very much a, a, a sense that how, you know, how do we thank people who go about their jobs, who, who now, who before, and hopefully into the future will be supporting us. Um, and the importance of, of, of a social, socially based sort of care system as, as important as the NHS is, that, that it is about others. It's not necessarily about, it's not about them thinking that, um, or us thinking that they're just there for us. It's really important that we appreciate who, who and what they do. And it's important to acknowledge that the NHS was set up on the 5th of July to uh, 1948, you know, over 70 years ago to, to provide social care and to provide care when it was needed, not on the basis of whether you could afford to be cared for, which I think is, is the mark of any civil society is how you look after those who are the most vulnerable. And as part of that, what happened as the work evolved and it did get destroyed and sort of um, had to be renewed through um, various storms and through rainstorms, very slowly other people started adding their own science, like the one in the uh, middle here for the nurse, Donald Sveto. And I met his friend who said, can I put a sign up? And he came to add to it. So it became this sort of civic space, a space that is not bound by you know opening times or hours. It became some way of you know, passing on that baton of appreciation to others. And it wasn't just for the NHS. And it was very important to acknowledge that, yes, that, it, you know, the NHS is, is people. It is people we know. It, it's been, you know, my parents, my grandparents, my brother. It's, you know, it's about acknowledging that sense that, well, this work became about acknowledging the idea of who, who cares for us. And why do they care for us? And why that is continually and should always be important. And the other thing that really did chime with me was actually that work wasn't mine. The minute that it went outside, a little bit like a show, if you have a show that opens in a gallery, the moment those doors open, the private view happens, the work suddenly isn't yours anymore. It has a life beyond you and, and you're not necessarily, well, not necessarily not in control of, of that at all. So much so that, when I was installing at night and obviously as the nights drew out and it became lighter, I'd have to go out later in the night to do that. I would come into contact with people who weren't necessarily appreciating the sentiment of, of the work, which was also interesting, but equally, and I think I'll leave you with this. There was a, a an interaction after I'd been shouted out a few times and um, advised that I shouldn't be doing it in less than polite terms. Um, I was installing some signs at the top end um, of, of the work, which is, which at this point was about 50 meters long. So up from the corner, what the, the photograph you're, you're looking at now is a photograph of um, the corner of uh, Grove Road and Rove, Ro, sorry, Grove Road and Roman Road. And behind the signs is Wennington Green, which is a, a park that came out of it. In fact, it's the same park that Rachel White Reed's house uh, was in. And I was just down, down the road from where these two men photographing the signs are here. And this car drew up and I could hear it slowing down and I thought, oh, I'm not going to look around, don't look around. So I carried on installing the sign and um, I then just heard applause and clapping. And I thought, that's a bit unusual. Why, why are they doing that? I'm just putting up signs. And then I turned around and it was uh, four nurses at the end of their shift had left the Royal London Hospital, which coincidentally is where the proposals are on the 11th floor. And they were just going home after their 12 hour shift. And they just said, thank you. And that was more than, yeah, that, that was not anything that I could plan or it was just, it was quite overwhelming in, in that point. But um, it feels like uh, my time has gone very quickly and I hope I haven't spoken too quickly, but um, I just want to say thank you again to Daniel and Eva and, and Katsu for involving me in today. And um, I think we're going over to a, a Q and A now. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, that was really interesting. I, um, yeah, indeed, the Royal London is, is very much a live hospital and works do get uh, damaged or stolen. Um, but that's- Sorry, I was supposed to mention that. <laughs> that's okay. It, you know, it, it's live. The, the, the hospital is very much like a, a fast moving river. So that kind of thing happens. Um, we, and, and thank you also for that nice summary of your work as it all relates to the NHS. I know there's quite a bit of other work that you've done, including the work with the League of Nurses, which sounded like a 
spectacular. Yeah, the Royal College of Nurses. Yeah, that was on uh, in 2016, celebrating their centenary. And and just the way that it, the menu was based on your family's recipe, family in uh, your family who had all worked in, within the NHS and the spontaneous thing it was very nice. But um, indeed, we are going to move on to to questions now. So maybe everybody can come back on. Um, I think the best way to do this is for me to sort of um, scroll through some of the questions. We won't probably be able to get to all of them, but um, one question that came up from Magena for Eva was to measure the about uh, about measuring the uplift in the mood by seventy two percent. I think the question said ninety two percent, but I understand it's it's seventy two percent. So maybe um, Eva wants to speak to that. Yeah. But I, I was also going to quickly say the probably the best thing to do is to review all of your incredible co um, uh, collation of information. Uh, that that's a place to start. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, and I think I sent the link to the actual study so anybody can go through the details. In a nutshell, um, the market research and analytics team developed the survey along with art program curators, and it was um, deployed by email. So email was sent to the patient panel. And then uh, the scales that were used were so-called anchored scales which said significantly worsened, somewhat worsened, no effect, somewhat improved or significantly improved. And that information does, then was collected and analyzed. Okay, good. Um, there was a question uh, directed to Daniel about your invitation to do some research. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the visual art collection that, that comprises part of our overall collections, those. All of those works were photographed by Art UK um, a few years ago, which is kind of UK arts charity. Um, so they're all available to view online um, in very nice kind of high res images. Um, so I think the link that was shared very early on in the, the chat by, by, by a member of the, the team organizing today's events, if you, if you follow that through to the kind of um, associated kind of assets and things. There's links to our pages on the Art UK website where you can view all of them. I mean, in terms of, in terms of kind of broader access to our archive and museum collections, um, as you can probably guess, like most kind of, uh, kind of cultural organizations, kind of heritage organizations, we're, we're slowly easing out of uh, a kind of pandemic related lockdown. So we are, we are beginning to offer appointments for, for kind of on-site consultation, but I, it comes with a health warning, unfortunately, like everything has to be in 2021, that we're, we're very slowly getting back to the idea of having, having researchers on site. But fortunately with the art collection, as I say, um, it has been photographed and, and, is, and is available online. Um, that's not the case for a lot of our other archive material, unfortunately, because nobody's offered to, uh, to pay to photograph and digitize it all for us yet. So, uh, but yeah, the, 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 the art collection is certainly online and with kind of contextual information and things. And you can also conduct research on it and volunteer additional information via the Art UK website if you happen to know more about some of the paintings, because as I said, one of the challenges with a lot of these artworks is they have quite a confused kind of uh, history or provenance. So we're always keen to hear from somebody who might see one of the paintings and think, I know precisely who that anonymous unknown clinician is. So outs outsourcing the, the, the cataloging to other people, it's always, always beneficial. Interesting. Also, the, the point about digitization is also huge. I mean, and I know also that you've had to recently move the parts of the collection. So it's uh... Yes, Peter had some images from our uh, from our old site in Aldgate, which we 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 moved from during the pandemic. So yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting uh, 12, 13 months. Right, interesting. I know that Peter did his project well before you started working there. So, hmm. uh, just uh, there was another question about actually getting copies of Peter's book. So I just quickly say that they are available through Vital Arts. So just if anyone is interested. Um, just be in touch with Vital Arts. He's signed them all or most of them. So you can have a signed copy of his book. Um, there is a question specifically for Peter from Delphine regarding the NHS work and where it is now. I know that is information Peter might not be able to discuss. Oh, I can. 
I can say that um, I'm very happy to say that it's actually in the collection of uh, Museum of London. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you can announce it finally. <laughs> We've known about yeah, it. For I've, I've said it now. It's just between us, isn't it? We're not live or anything. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, it's in the collection of uh, Museum of London, which which contextually is fantastic because they have work from suffragettes, uh, Brian Hall's uh, protest outside of Parliament. So it's um, it feels like it's absolutely the right home, and I'm really thrilled about that. So, um, we actually, I didn't say that actually we took it down on the 28th of May, which completely coincidentally coincided with the last clap for the NHS. And there were 10 of us who took it down and put it into a higher van. And we managed to, to take down seven weeks work in about an hour and three quarters. So it was it was gone. And it was very important that it just the work disappeared rather than it being left there to be destroyed by various means, whether that's weather or intervention or, or whatever it would be. So but thank you for the question anyway. Yes. Yeah, so that's it's good to to tell people that's where it is. Finally, that's great. And it's really um, important to have that work at the Museum of London. You know, it's yeah, very much so. a London moment that the world felt, but the way that you expressed it specifically in London on that corner, it, it's very well, it's wonderful that it's, it, it, that it's at the, that museum. Um, we are getting other questions. Uh, a uh, comment, fascinating, thank you all. Daniel, can you tell me your thoughts about embargoed images of patients? I am a disabled artist working with the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital Archives, and there are many issues around sharing of images and patients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, obviously I focus today on the uh, the art collection that's in our care because, because, because it's kind of a distinct part of the collection, but um, we do have, within the archive collections, we have a huge number of, of, of photographs of patients from, from the Victorian era onward and uh, preceding the, the photographs, we also have a lot of oil paintings um, of patients as well. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a, there, are, there are kind of ethical um, challenges around sharing a lot of that material. Um, and we do tend to kind of undertake a kind of sensitivity review. I mean, we do, we do, we do share images sometimes, but it, it depends very much on the context in which the image was taken. Um, you know, how aware that the patient was that that image would be shared more widely, often not something I would have thought about. How old it is, of course. Um, so, I mean, obviously once, once somebody's deceased, the Data Protection Act doesn't apply, but I feel we still have a kind of ethical obligation to our patients, whether they're current patients or historic patients. Um, yeah, it's a kind of, it's a challenging, it's a challenging area. I, um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I, I thought about talking about the, the kind of medical illustration collection that we have um, within our collections as well. But I mean, I think, I think the, the, the interesting thing about that is it's, it's a visual interest and we've loaned items to other um, museums to display in the past. But I would argue that that it would probably be very difficult to display any of that material within a contemporary healthcare setting, because the very nature of the material is potentially kind of upsetting and challenging. I think something you've spoken about before, Katsu, is kind of the fact that with a lot of the artwork, you want to get away from the human body almost with your works, and you know it can be very challenging to to bring depictions of kind of illness and and death essentially, um, even if they're historic, and kind of confront. A, a, a current patient with them there's you know the kind of the context of where that material is displayed whether it's divorced from its original context can can really change it that's not a very that's not a very straightforward answer unfortunately but yeah I mean we, it is challenging and I do think today with many of our where we where we have worked with kind of visual artists and things it hasn't tended to focus on on a lot of that material you know we do have lots of we have a big collection of kind of photographs of, of, of patients with sexually transmitted infections and things like that. But you know, access to that has to be incredibly restricted, um, just because of the shit, the nature of it, and the fact that you know we are we are first and foremost an NHS service. So we, you know, those priorities almost um, override, you mm -hmm. know, some of the other some of the other kind of aesthetic kind of kind of considerations we might have around that material. Mm, interesting. You, you, and you, you actually bring up a good point about the distinction between picturing disease, which a lot of people come to us and they say, oh, I have an image of my brain scan. I want to show, you know, make an artwork out of it. Or, you know, there is a lot of misconception that, um, that 
presenting the body or the disease would be an appropriate place in a hospital. So I often make a distinction between the biomedical, like the Wellcome Trust is a great place to do that, or, but often a hospital, as you say, is not really where people want to go see those images. Um, we have a, uh, a question, a couple of questions coming in. Um, one from Claire as asking if any of you been, uh, thank you for the very interesting talks. I wonder if any of you have been specifically involving medical students to promote arts and health in their curriculum. I, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. I've, I've been doing uh, and, and delighted to be working with QMUL and the medical students. So I, for the past few years, give a talk about um, art and contemporary art and sort of what we do. But my interest there is to really help promote visuality in young medics. And um, I'm delighted to do that. It's very different than when I lecture for curating students or graduate, you know, the Quartoto or wherever, you know, I might ever be invited to. So uh, I think it is important to, to think about that kind of creativity. But I bet uh, maybe Eva has a more I think, it's a, I think it's a great question because it's addressing the future of arts and humanities in medical settings. Um, you're right, um, spot on Katsu, when you mentioned skill of observation. So one of the things that have been explored in collaboration with students is teaching students how to observe details by teaching them how to observe art. Um, the other thing that I have noticed is uh, we didn't have arts and health as part of our curriculum in medical schools, but there is certainly a trend of trying to bring it in and it has to be defined first for two reasons. One is what we just mentioned, it does improve uh, observation skills and also communication skills. Um, but the third reason is if, um, if medical students is passionate about piano or being a musician, or being a painter, or why are we limiting that capability of that particular provider, caregiver, where when we now know that actually, A, it can help patients, it can serve as a therapeutic tool, and B, it can improve the performance uh, and decrease stress levels and improve mood of the caregiver. So I would say um, that's a really call to action to a lot of medical schools around the world to consider uh, bringing arts and health into the curriculum of the students. Okay. Um, there's a question here about payments, how payments are decided for artists whose work is featured in the hospital. So I'm gonna uh, take that and um, reiterate, which I hope I made very clear, but always saying that all of the art that we bring to the hospital is always charitably funded. So it's never a question of selecting, um, having a nurse versus a painting. So it's definitely all charitably funded. And the answer to that specific question is, how long is a piece of string? So we go to a site, we look at it, we decide how much we think we would need in order to commission an artwork. And then we go and try to find the money. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, usually we do. So that's, it's just the expertise of having done this for so long. You know, Bottle Arts has been around for over 20 years and we make a judgment about how much we think a, a fee, you know, what kind of a budget that project would need. And like I said, then we try to, we try to, to find the, the funding for it. Um, so otherwise, um, there are several other questions I'm just trying to hear, uh, tease out. So uh, maybe someone is asking from Jay, would love to hear you talk about exhibition or commissions partnership with the NHS museums and galleries. Are these becoming more common? What are the challenges and benefits? For example, the art galleries Artemisa portrait tour to a GP practice in Yorkshire. That's a really interesting initiative. Um, Eva, is that something you might want to talk about? How those kind of collaborations, or maybe Daniel as well? Go ahead, Daniel. Oh gosh. Um, well, I mean, we we I mean, we're we're always willing to to loan items from our from our collections, but unfortunately, as a as a kind of small function, a small team within 
within the NHS, we, we don't have a, a kind of designated budget for kind of commissioning activity. So, um, I mean, some of, our, some of our material is on loan. Um, quite a lot of our material is on loan to other, to other museums and institutions. Although I must say in most cases, it's, it's not within a kind of, it's been, it's been taken out of a healthcare context almost and kind of, uh, you know, kind of placed within a different, a different context. So, so the images are often, are often used because of their kind of social history value or what they tell you about kind of local history or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something we'd be interested to do, you know, we're kind of, as a service, we're open to, uh, we're open to approaches from individuals, but I think it's, it, it's challenging because, as I say, you know, our kind of, our primary function is the kind of the custodianship of the collection. So, our ability to kind of undertake activity beyond that is is more limited. I mean, we do we do manage a small, although actually all of the team are qualified archivists, we do also manage some museum spaces um, on site. And obviously that does include kind of artwork alongside kind of archive objects and things like that. But that is very much situated within, within the hospital itself. Um, and one thing we are always conscious of is that in some ways that being so closely tied to a geographical location is a is a challenge really because um you know it relies on people coming to a set space and as i as i alluded to in my talk a lot of our material are in kind of designated her almost kind of heritage buildings or heritage spaces within the hospital so whether there's enough permeability for other people to encounter them or not is debatable mm, okay uh, I saw a question, I can't put my finger on it now, but it was asking about the morgue, and I'm sorry it made people depressed. Um, it is depressing, of course. The artwork, specifically in connection to the morgue, was developed with the clerical team. So we met with the imam and the vicar and the, the whole clerical team, and the artwork was uh, in several spots. So in one case, there was artwork above the viewing trolley, so where the body is laid out, supine, there was a wall behind there, so we put the artworks there. This is the artwork by Julia Vogel, uh, really wonderful artist, wonderful to work with. And that, the motif based on William Morris, because he's a local, <laughs> another local artist to uh, one of our hospitals, Waltham Forest, um, was also reiterated in, in a frieze wrapping around the ceiling. She made soft furnishing, this tote bag that I showed, and also a light box. So it was a block, it was an old building. There was a, a window that had been blocked off. And then we managed to make enough room in that window to make a light box. So it looked like a stained glass window. So there was a lot of different elements to that artwork, which was kind of a whole immersive uh, experience of the artwork. And uh, I think it's a lot better to have beautiful artwork there while you're seeing your loved one for the last time virtually um, than, than just having a, a plain black wall, blank wall. So um, there was a question about portraits for Eva, which Eva replied. Um, my question is for Eva. Portraits in Hospital India are in black and white. Can you please explain a bit in detail how did it help the patient? How did the patient feel on doing their portrait? Why all, all, why all are just sitting position, not lying in the bed in any other position related to hospital? Is this intentionally done? If so, if yes, are you able to explain a bit more? And it, I think Eva, has so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you for the question. I think the video that I said will be self-explanatory. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's about, as artist is saying, it's about the time that we are giving to and sharing with the patients. Most of the patients were cancer patients. Um, and to me personally, I think whether it's black or white, it's completely irrelevant compared to color. Again, it's about the attention that we are bringing to this space. And um, for the first time, some of those patients says that they really think now but somebody cares about them by giving them that time, enough time to even do the portrait. So I would encourage people who, who are wondering um, why this is important to just watch the video. Okay. We just have a few minutes left. Um... 
Do you guys have, I mean, there's lots of other questions or do you guys have something you, anything you want to bring up to each other? It might uh, be a moment to, to, to do that now. Otherwise, there is a question from Susan about a sustainable model for arts and health in healthcare setting involving not just students, but with the healthcare staff, with the healthcare staff and giving them protected time to be involved with projects. Yeah, that's a very good question more and more now. We are definitely thinking about the staff. From my point of view, until recently, we have such limited resources and a tiny, tiny team that we were just focusing on patient um, experience. Um, there, now with the pandemic and added stress, there is a lot more activity in art therapy happening, um, which is obviously a separate issue than what we do because of course making art can be therapeutic, whereas we see viewing great art has therapeutic. So it's the difference between the, the, the process of making it, which we, Vital Arts isn't that involved in, we're more involved with the presentation of it. But maybe somebody else has a comment on that. Well, I'd, I'd like to say that it's a great suggestion. It's been something that is, that's been lingering for a long time now. Um, I do think at one point, those who express desire to be involved in arts and health concept as a part of the hospital care, um, they should be allocated some time. And I boldly say that allocate like 10%, 20% of time, clearly defined what their role would be that again will make everybody much, much happier. And that's also my personal experience talking to my colleagues, whether nurses or any caregiver, doctors, um, anybody in the hospital, they are much happier when they can actually show their passion and speak a different language that is much more simpler to understand than just numbers. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, we just uh, have time to sort of wrap things up. I would like to say, I think on behalf of everybody here, there, that if, if some questions haven't been answered or not as fully, um, there are ways to be in touch with all of us. So Eva, you, you ha have your website, the Artisan website, which you can take maybe some, some questions to. Um, if anyone can contact me through Vital Arts, absolutely no problem. I'd be delighted to carry on the conversation. Daniel, I think you're also reachable. Yeah, if you uh, if you if you search online for Bart's Health Archives and Museums, um, you should find our our web pages, and we've also got a Twitter account at B. I'm going to get the uh, Twitter handle wrong now because I always do. I think it's at B H A A M, but maybe just search Twitter Bart's Health Archives and Museums because I've probably got it wrong. I put it on my last slide. I should have kept it somewhere to hand, shouldn't I? But yeah, if you search for us online. It's, it's relatively easy to find our, our contact details and find out more about our service as well. And Peter, do you have your own website? I do, but could they could people contact me through you? Is that all right? Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> all right, so I think uh, as the hour has just passed, uh, one minute after the hour, I would like to thank you all very much for spending the afternoon uh, with me and talking about these issues which are so, so important to me and to all of us, I think, and to our moment right now. And um, Peter Livesic, thank you very much thank for you showing for us your practice. Thank you very much. And Eva, for your incredible expertise in a very specific uh, data-driven and humanist uh, way. I'm so grateful that you were able to bring all that information together. And Daniel, great to see the old stuff. I know that we probably have a lot of museum people listening to us, or if they're still listening, uh, but who have joined us initially. And I think it's quite interesting to look at the history of art and how- Alert from Google Chrome. Print photos from your switch with this gadget. And how it- <laughs> Last minute question from a robot. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but um, yes, and how, how that whole history of art in a hospital for the, the donor, the potential donor has shifted now to our um, concern with the, with the patient. But uh, thank you and thank you to Martin and thank you uh, to the network for inviting us. I've been very delighted to convene this session and to talk about what we do and to invite you guys to, as I say, have a stretch and a look a roam across the topic a little bit. I hope it's been interesting and thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.